Hello and welcome to this episode of Fort Worth Forward. Today's guests include Anna Martinez Shropshire with Idea Public Schools, neighborhood police officers Joseph Spragans and Matt McClellan, and restaurant entrepreneur Sarah Castillo. Let's get started. Now I'm joined by Anna Martinez Shropshire. She is the Tarrant County Executive Director of Idea Public Schools. Welcome, Anna. How are you today? I'm doing well. Hi, Good. Michael. Good. Good to be here with you. Well, Fort, this is called Fort Worth Forward, but you're not originally from Fort Worth. So tell us a little bit about your background and how you got here and maybe overall your idea philosophy about teaching and, and education in general. Yeah, you're right. I'm not from Fort Worth, though when I moved here in 2017, I always heard that I should say that I got here as fast as I could. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so while I'm not from here, this is home and I intend to make Fort Worth home for a very long time. Um, I made my way to Fort Worth by way of Chicago. So I spent the last 10 years prior to coming here in Chicago. First, I started uh, my own public charter school named Rowe Elementary School. And then I worked for new leaders, um, really supporting Chicago public schools with their principal pipeline. I grew up in LA though. That's where I went to elementary school, middle school, high school, and college. Was a grad from UCLA. But I was born outside of the country. So I originally come from El Salvador and I came to this country when I was four. Great, where did you first move to when you? Los Angeles. Los Angeles, mm -hmm. great, yes. So you're with Idea Public Schools. It's a new charter school that's here in, uh, in Tarrant County. How, you know, tell me a little bit about Idea, what makes it unique? Yeah, Idea Public Schools has existed in the state of Texas for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. We got started in the Rio Grande Valley, originally Michael as an after school program for fourth graders through seventh grade. Um, we served about 150 students originally. Since then, we have grown in some of the largest cities in Texas, um, including San Antonio, Austin, uh, El Paso, Houston, Tarrant County, of course, um, and most recently, uh, Midland, Odessa area. What really makes us unique is that for 14 consecutive years, we have delivered on the promise that if your child attends our school and stays with us and graduates from our high schools, they will not only be accepted to the college or university of their choice, but they will also matriculate. So for 14 years, we've delivered on the promise of 100% high school graduation, college acceptance, and college matriculation. So that's an interesting topic that you bring up about 100% college acceptance. You know, there's sort of a, a back and forth happening in our country now that college might not be for all. So what is it that, uh, you know, idea, why does it continue to push for college for all? Yeah, there is a back and forth today mm -hmm. around college not being for everyone. Um, and what is accurate today is that in order for an individual to make a livable wage, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily have to have a college degree, right? Right. We know that there are jobs that folks Technical can jobs, have, yeah. correct, mm -hmm. where they can make a livable wage. Our mission, though, is not to um, ensure that all of our students have a livable wage. The majority of the students we serve come from low-income communities, and so really what we're talking about is breaking the cycle of generational poverty. Mm -hmm. And we know that in order to do that, you can't possibly uh, do that by simply making a livable wage. We want our students to make more than a livable wage yeah. and really to get to a place where their children and their children's children are also thriving. Moreover, Michael, I think what's important to note right now is that uh, back in 2019, pre-pandemic, right, the unemployment rate for um, individuals who had a high school degree but did not have a college degree was hovering around just a little under 4%. And since the pandemic, just one year later in April of 2020, that unemployment rate ballooned almost four times for individuals who had a high school degree, but not a college degree. Yeah, and I think I've seen some numbers lately as we're getting post pandemic, the, who's getting hired more quickly are people with college degrees or some sort of technical skill. And those that have no high school or a little college are still sitting on the sidelines and can't find jobs. Do you find that same? We are, we're yeah. seeing that as well. I mean, at the end of the day, right, what we're talking about in our K-12 system, mm -hmm. we wanna play the long-term game. Mm -hmm. And we know that for um, our communities, the communities that we serve, low-income, kids of color, communities of color, we wanna see impact generation over generation over generation. So it's not enough to, just go to college and have a livable wage for one generation. 
we wanted to exist beyond their generation as well. And you get a lot of first generation college students, right? Yes, we they do. Go, go Nearly three quarters of our kids who graduated last year and were accepted to some of the top universities in the country were first gen college bound kids. Wow. Well, I, I wanted to have this conversation with you because um, I remember it was a chance meeting. Um, you were walking out of um, Maddie Parker's uh, mm -hmm. office at City Hall uh, before she was mayor. That's so when right. she was chief of staff and Maddie said, let me introduce you to this woman. She's going to do great things here in uh, Tarrant County. So we started talking and I think you were having some issues or trying to go into different parts of Fort Worth. And I said, I got a place for you. We got this Las Vegas trail program that we've, we've uh, set up. And so look over here. And within a, a year, you had a campus open and operating there. And, you know, so what do you look at? What are you looking for when you're looking for campus locations? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things I want to highlight here. I remember that day very vividly. <laughs> Um, and, and I think it's what makes Fort Worth very special, mm -hmm. right? I wasn't from here, um, but I was able to really connect with folks very early on. And so timing was everything. Being in Maddie's office on that day and having yeah. her walk me over to your office yeah. that day was um, perfect timing, if mm -hmm. you will. There are technical things that we look at when we're looking for land as we're thinking about where we want to build a school, right? Those technical pieces are really to the tune of size. Our sites are usually anywhere between 10 to 15 acres. As you can imagine, we have a price point for how much we are able to pay for land as well. And so um, beyond size, price point, and then is there an opportunity to offer high quality uh, public school seats? There are some essential pieces, and that's where I would say that uh, the conversation with you that day and with mm -hmm. Councilman Byrd at that time that day as well was um, really essential because what you both had that I did not have was a more macro level understanding of your district, specifically of Las Vegas Trail, and you already had a vision for how you all were thinking about how you might want to revitalize the community with the community. Mm -hmm. um, and so education plays a small but very important component in that vision. And so the timing around what we were looking to do for Idea Public Schools in Fort Worth and what you all were looking to do in Las Vegas Trail was essential. Um, and that, Michael, I would say is probably the best way to enter a community. It was through then your connections and the LVT Rise work that I was personally able to meet um, not only folks who lived in the community, mm -hmm. but also people who worked, right? I actually right. met the principal from the school down the street, got to learn from her about the community, got to be in her space. Um, and so those connections, because our timing was perfect mm -hmm. on that day, were essential to our ability to enter Las Vegas Trail. And frankly, work that we're very proud of, right? Mm -hmm. So the school is now in operation for year three. Uh, currently, our Idea Rise campus, um, which by the way, was also named to honor the work that you all were doing with LVT Rise. Yeah. Um, Idea Rise currently serves grades um, K through four at the elementary level. And we have a fully built out middle school right now, six through eight. Um, over the next couple of years, it will be a K-12 uh, campus. We are incredibly proud of um, the accomplishments of Idea Rise right now. Um, if you look at our state scores from last year, even in a pandemic year, um, our middle school in particular did incredibly well and is the highest performing middle school in, in the district right now. Yeah, so what, do you th what, what is the source of those results? How, how, did, how did you get there while other schools were not performing well? Yeah, I think there's some things that IDEA does um, that are just good practices, mm -hmm. um, and I think they're important to name. Number one, culture for us really matters, right? We get very clear on what we expect in terms of what we expect from students, from staff members, from teachers, from parents. We do a lot of work early on before we launch a school to get to know the community, to onboard our new families, to onboard our staff, um, to ensure that we are all aligned to the same values in our operating. Um, and our behaviors are essentially operationalizing those values day in and day out. 
academically, there are some things that we do that are really um, also essential in any school system. We're very clear about what our goals are. We're very clear about ensuring that we're putting rigorous content in front of kids. And I would argue, Michael, that undergirding those two things, right, culture and academic rigor, is high levels of accountability. Sure. And what I mean by that is there is no denying that everyone who occupies a seat at IDEA Public Schools um, is very clear on the goals they themselves are trying to accomplish, the goals their team is accomplishing, and how they all funnel up to the ultimate goal of 100% college going rate. Yeah, I, I love that you bring up that idea of accountability because I've been to the classrooms, watched the teachers teach uh, on multiple campuses that y'all have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for an example, uh, I, easy exa easiest example I can use is in the math class that I watched. Um, the teachers taught their class that day. At the end of the class, there's a, a question or a problem that the kids have to solve. Um, and if 100% of the kids don't get that problem correct, uh, they don't go back to the kid and go, why didn't you get this wrong? They go back to the teacher and say, why didn't you connect with those two kids? And they're able to pivot very quickly the next class, et cetera, mm -hmm. to understand how they're going to connect with that student. So uh, that, it's just an interesting example of that sort of accountability because I think it's with the teachers and the students both on both sides. Yeah, and I think you bring up a really critical point around the accountability of adults, right? At the end sure. of the day, the adults in the system are the ones who have to get it right so that kids can win. And accountability, you're, in any class that you walk in, it would not be uncommon. Um, we have this uh, belief in our organization that we can't wait until the next period or until the next day or until the next week to make something change. Right. And so it's not uncommon to be in a classroom and to experience what we call real-time coaching mm -hmm. so that teachers and leaders can change their play in the middle of the game right. to then impact to the end outcome. We often say that it's actually too late when we finally get an assessment and see whether or not kids got it. We should know in real time whether or not kids are on track to getting it. Yeah, so like a six-week report is already too late to come back correct. And, and, and correct what's going on. Well, I've, I've, I've often said, and I think I stole it from y'all, that um, you know, a kid's future should not be decided by their zip code. And so you know, something about I, I, Idea Public School, but also any charter school, is they're not tied to a zone or a zip code. It's a lottery system. Anybody can apply, right? But, correct. Yeah. yeah, so we are a, a lottery system, uh, which means that our families apply to enter our school and then are accepted to a blind, through a blind lottery. Our application opens up really early, yeah. actually. So our applications are already open. For the 22-23 school correct, year, Correct, right? yeah. for the 22-23 school year. Um, and then our lottery is usually held in February. You know, one, one important piece that I just want to name, both for personal reasons and professional reasons, a child's future are not to be uh, dictated by the zip code or by the um, household income they were born into, the right? That's personal very personal circumstances of their parents, correct. right? Correct. Yeah. It's very personal for me. I shared with you I came from El Salvador. I myself was undocumented when I came here. I was an English language learner. I grew up in a low-income community. Um, I was the first in my family to go to college and um, graduate from college. And that has really drastically changed my own life and then certainly the life of, of my two daughters now as a result. Um, and so I've dedicated my entire career to ensuring that um, basically that a child zip code is not the number one predictor for their success. Um, and at IDEA, we fundamentally believe that and everything we do and say is to ensure that all of our kids have not only access to high quality instruction in our building, in our classrooms, but also that they have opportunities to experience the world outside, um, outside of their school, outside of their community, so that they can grasp how large the world is right. and what their role in um, their community is as they think about their future trajectory. Yeah, if you're not exposed to those opportunities or things outside what you know, you don't know they exist. So you Correct. don't know what to dream or strive for. And so that's a really, really good point. And there seems to be 
some debate too about charter schools and public schools. What do you say to those people that, that say um, charter schools take away from, in some way, shape, or form, what public schools are trying to do? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things that it are important for folks to really understand and gain clarity on. At a high level, I think it's always important to start with just understanding how funding in the state of Texas works for public schools. So first and foremost, charter schools are public schools. Um, in the state of Texas, public schools are funded by way of two sources, state uh, sources and then also local sources. Charter schools do receive per pupil funding through the state of Texas. However, we do not receive any local funding. Um, and so if a family chooses to go to a charter school, a public charter school instead, their local taxes, if you will, stay mm -hmm. in the local public school as well. And so um, I think it's important to understand a little bit about how that funding works. The other piece um, that I think is really critical to understand is that public charter schools in the state of Texas are also held to the same accountability standards as are all public school districts in the state of Texas. So we are held to the same standards with regard to state testing, with regard to attendance. Certainly, as you can see now, all the COVID policies that are being um, essentially rolled out through the state, those are also things that public charter schools like ours are also held accountable to. Good, good thoughts there. Um, in, in closing, what, what's the future of education in Fort Worth and Tarrant County? What does that look like to you? Yeah, I think the future is really bright, Michael, and I'll tell you why. In my experience, having worked in both traditional public school districts and also charter public schools in big cities like LA and Chicago and Miami, um, what I think is so unique about what's happening in Fort Worth is that you have visionaries who are leaders in multiple spaces in the city, be it civic leaders, philanthropic leaders, business leaders, community leaders, who all love Fort Worth and wanna see Fort Worth thrive economically, right? I heard you say that Fort Worth is the 12th largest city. Well, there's some debate right now. Or 13th, 13th right? Or 12. 12 or 13. We're, 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 we're like 12 and a half. 12 and a half. That's what Let's say, say 12 yeah. and a half today, right? <laughs> that there is, there is this big vision for the city, for us to thrive economically, for this to be a great place to work, to play, to live. Um, and we know that in order for us to get there as a city, there are certain things that need to be put in place for us to thrive. And education is simply one of those foundational yeah, yeah. pieces. And so what I see here is an appetite mm -hmm. for diversifying the educational ecosystem so that all families, all children have a choice. And again, to our earlier point, it's not rooted in the zip code that they live in. That's right. Right. Well, thank you for coming today to share your thoughts. I'm happy we were able to make some time to see us and sort of share the vision of what IDEA is doing, but also just the, the state of education here in Tarrant County. I, I, I agree with you. We have some uh, great folks that want to see Fort Worth succeed. Um, and so thank you for being a part of that ecosystem and helping our kids do that. Absolutely. Thank Thanks you. so much for having me. Great. Thank you. We'll be right back. Now it's my pleasure to welcome Fort Worth Police Officers Joe Spragans and Matt McClellan, who are part of our Neighborhood Patrol Officer NPO program. Welcome, guys. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us in here. You're welcome. Thanks. No, I, I've long been a fan of, of y'all and what the NPO program does, but tell us a little bit about yourselves, uh, how you got into the police department, what made you want to become a police officer and eventually become an NPO. Do you remember that far back? I do remember that far back. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I've been a Fort Worth police officer. I started in November of 92 in the academy. Um, I always loved motorcycles, so I was a motor officer for 19 years. Um, I like to talk. Anybody that knows me will tell you I, I, I talk a lot and have a lot of words. Uh, so this neighborhood patrol officer thing, when the opportunity came along, um, I believe in it. I believe it's the backbone of why we have the support we do in Fort Worth. Um, I tell people it is a customer-based uh, when you have an issue, you can get a hold of your neighborhood officer and we handle it direct. It's like calling Dell computer people and telling the same story 
having the same issue the next day, you got to tell it over again. Mm -hmm. Once we get involved, we're your go-to, and, and we can try to take care of that. So I think it's positive for the city, and it's positive for the police department, and it's been a good fit for me. So that's great. How about how did you get into the force and everything? Uh, well. Uh, my dad's a retired Fort Worth police officer, so the idea was always there. But I started a little later when I was 32 years old. I okay. owned a uh, owned a business, worked in bike shops and that kind of stuff. So, <coughs> being a business owner and being uh, involved with the community on that level, uh, kind of grew that interest for me to be an MPO when I joined the police department. It's something I always wanted to do. So I joined in 2012, okay. and uh, I think a few years ago I became an MPO, maybe three, three and a half. So, been eating it up ever since. It's, there a great, you go. it's a great gig. And y'all have a relationship that I wasn't aware of until you just told me about it. That sounds weird. Yeah, <laughs> it does sound weird. Uh, I rode motor for 19 years. Uh, his daddy was a motor officer before I got on, and uh, Keith, his dad, was, is a great guy, just like Joey. And uh, oh. so I rode with Keith a lot because our personalities coincided together, and we were both assigned to the West Side. So we rode motor for years before his dad retired. They, Nine years. I remember oh. hearing stories about Matt when I was a little guy. The little guy. Yeah. And I knew all about Joey <laughs> from his daddy before, long before I ever knew yeah. Joey. So you got so. stories. Oh, you got yeah. stories. Good ones. <laughs> yeah. Well, all, all good. All good. Well, I, it's, it's funny to kind of bring this up because there is a camaraderie with y'all, whether you know each other or not, I think with the police department in that sense. And I think that helps us sort of, helps you do your job too a little bit. It's a small world in that sense. For sure. But for our, our viewers that Let's dig a little bit more. I really wanted to talk about the, the MPO program, and you kind of hinted at some of it in your opening parts, but what is it, how, do, how does it serve the neighborhood, and, and really, you know, for me, from the district uh, office, it's my line of, first line of contact. I'll contact you, your off, your, whomever the MPO is for that beat, and um, you know, here's the problem, here's what's happening. Sometimes you already know about the problem. You've been, maybe it's, it's been happening for a long time, but mm -hmm. tell, us how, you know, tell us about the MPO program. Uh, chief Thomas Wyndham, I believe it was like 28 years ago, and he was a chief when I started here, realized that to get community involvement um, and the support, you need to let them be involved. Mm -hmm. And so he started this neighborhood patrol program, and it was very small at the time. Uh, I believe now we have 90 beats, and I believe we have 90 neighborhood patrol officers citywide. And like I said at the beginning, it gives us that go-to. I, I tell people I'm kind of like the general contractor. If you get a hold of me... Yeah. I'm not calling your plumber or your electrician, but if it's something that's TPNW, I know how to get a hold of them. If it's something else, um, I'll have a TCU area, so I work hand in hand with them. Uh, it's we bounce things off each other, but it's us. You give us the issue and the problem. If we can't handle it, we know how to get the right answer for you. That's great. So you have the TCU area down in Tanglewood, West Cliff, that yep. area. Yep. Right, and you have Walsh and. Yeah, Walsh Ranch, which is its own beat, right. and another beat uh, over off the west of the Loop, White Settlement, Clifford area, all that. Right, and you said it started off with, how the program started off with how many? I don't know how many exactly started. I know when it first started, there was actually only two neighborhood patrol officer assigned supervisors. Okay. And the other guys, it went off of the regular patrol sergeants to where now, I believe each division has two neighborhood patrol sergeants, and that's... That's like we have 19 in our office. That's right. So how many total MPOs? Across I think the there's 90, yeah. if I have my numbers correct. And I th uh, they're, they're CCPD funded too. Yeah. It's part of the CCPD b budget. So, w what's a, a typical day like for you? Returning calls from either overnight or the day of um, about random complaints in your in your neighborhoods. It could range from noise complaints to. I got solicitors coming up to my door and they seem suspicious and stuff like that to more serious stuff about, you know, crime trends, thefts, uh, stuff like that. So at the root of our job is to recognize trends going on in your area uh -huh. and how to uh, squash those, pull them from different resources throughout the department, through the, throughout the city. Uh, yeah, just it can range. Yeah, I mean it, it's a it's a wide range of what we do. I mean you're on the on the ground intel that's pushed up and around mm -hmm. the department, right? Mm -hmm. That that helps maybe figure out what's happening in crime trends, as you said, so we right. can we can attack problems from d different angles. Yep. What about what's a typical day for you? It just depends on how many loud TCU parties or how <laughs> many parking complaints I have for the day. Um, I I don't sit still well, so I'm usually in my vehicle 
in my area because I like to answer calls for service uh, and assist patrol officers. Uh, first thing I do usually when I come in is read anything that happened overnight or answer my emails or phone calls from complaints or concerns that I've received. Um, and then I go out to businesses and I'll go to residential. Part of, part of my favorite thing is ride around weather like this with the windows down, you're going to meet a lot of people. That's mm -hmm. how I've made so many contacts in the neighborhood is just being out there and being available to somebody wants to tell you something going on. So um, every day is a little different, but predominantly, like I said, if I'm having a trend of certain burglaries in certain areas, then I'll get other, like our uh, criminal tracking unit or um, somebody else, you know, hey, hey guys, can you come out to our area and we're having these issues. Um, but it, it's kind of different every day, but um, I enjoy meeting the people. That's good. That's that's your job. I just have kind of a question of what's going on nationally and you know locally. You know, we've been committed to not defunding our police here and making sure that y'all have the assets that you need to do your job. But I would say that the relationships you've developed, people know who you are in the communities. That's your job. You're doing that community policing that we we talk about of sorts. But it's from the side of wait, we're here to help, and that's Correct. really our mm -hmm. our job. Do you have any thoughts sort of on that or what? How you know, nationally, we're I think morale's low with police officers, but I think when people see what you do and you're really out there with the neighborhood, it, it changes their opinion. I, I've got a lot of friends and relatives that work in other agencies all over. Mm -hmm. And I tell people I wouldn't do it anywhere but here because we do have the support of the community. And I think a lot of that goes back to this community policing and letting them be involved and being transparent and let them know what we're doing. But I can't tell you how many times when we're at restaurants, somebody comes up and either says, hey, I've paid for your meal, mm -hmm want to shake your hand, thank you for your, your job. Uh, I've stopped people before that'll still say thank you, you know, for being out here, we appreciate it. So we know we have the support, so I think the morale with Fort Worth Police Department is probably unique, mm -hmm. that it's probably much better than it is in some of these other departments. Any thoughts there? Agreed. <laughs> no, and, and it really falls on the MPOs in their areas to keep that to keep that morale up. Right. Right. I mean, we do have a very good thing going with the CCPD and mm -hmm. just the support of the citizens. And I mean, we're kind of at the front line there to keep that going, you know, because we're, to many of our residents and our beats, we're, we're the face of the department, right? We're the, right. we're the bridge, we're that link. So if uh, we fail on following up with calls and stuff like that, if, if, you know, a certain citizen in your beat, it's their first time calling their MPO, and then MPO never calls them back, mm -hmm. just leaves them hanging, their view of the department is now tainted. Right. No matter what. Right. I mean, it's going to take some, a big effort to rebuild that. So. That's right. What, what advice would you give, you know, just your average citizen, interact, how, how to interact with the MPO? What, you know, what, what advice would you give, give, give to them? Uh, as far as con contacting us? Well, or? yeah, or just in general, like that. Uh, your job, your role, like interaction with you, et cetera. I mean, you kind of talked about it a little bit already, but. Bottom line, it's customer based. We work for you, we work for the citizens. Right. You pay our salaries, you pay for our equipment. So if there's a need that we can help you with, please reach out and let us, give us the opportunity to help you. Uh, if you see us, come up and approach us. We're, we're all human. We just wear all this polyester and funny garb that we do, but we're human right. underneath all this. So feel free to come up and contact us. Yeah, that's a good point. You're human. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate what y'all do. And you know, you're know, you two of my, two parts of my district um, that I know has always been my first line to call you if this is happening, et cetera, uh, and encouraging people to, to contact you. So thanks for what y'all do. I appreciate it. I would like to say yes. that if a uh, citizen out, resident out there for your district uh -huh. has a complaint, reach out to your MPO first. <laughs> Don't, don't email the council member's office and then have that trickle down to us because it makes us look really bad. I, I agree because yeah. I tell people you Just can do that. Yeah. You can do that, but all it does, it's coming to us anyway. Yeah. Right. So give us the chance first. To it's true. I think people think that they'll get a little more reaction if they send it to the office, and I guess it does. But um, you're right. Y'all should be able to get, be given the chance to do your job first. Uh, yeah. And then, then if it doesn't happen, then let us know. and. We know that we will help push it in whatever way that it needs to happen. But thanks for what y'all do, and thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having us Thanks for having us Thank you. Appreciate you. Thanks. We'll be right back. Now I'm joined in studio by Sarah Castillo, who is a restaurant entrepreneur here in Fort Worth. 
Sarah, thanks for joining us. Oh my gosh, thank you for yeah, having me. No, so long been a fan of yours. Thank We've you. been friends for a long period of time too, but Taco Heads, Thinies, am I saying that right? Thinies, yes. Thinies Restaurant, uh -huh. which is named after your grandmother. Um, my mom. Your mom. Yes. And Side Saddle Saloon, which is now down in Mule Alley. Yep. Great. Well, I, you know, with this program, we wanted to highlight entrepreneurs uh, that are, um, you know, just out there just every day, you know, pushing forward, developing. And, you know, you are a definition of an entre entrepreneur in my mind because uh, you, you started out of a taco truck. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So well, tell us a little about that journey, like starting out of the truck and oh how gosh. things came together. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm born and raised Fort Worth girl, yeah. and I, I went to school in, in Austin, traveled around, so I lived in Aspen, New York, and Spain. And then when I came back home, I thought I originally, my plan was to move back to Austin. And then I just saw what was happening in Fort Worth around 2009, mm -hmm. and I just fell in love with it. And I was like, I need to get my boots in the ground here. Um, so came up with this idea of the food trailer, the taco trailer, and parked by on 7th Street next to 7th Haven, yep. um, and then eventually by Pug Mahone's. And, oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, and it's just been crazy since then. You've been grinding every day since then. Every day, like late hours, and it was crazy because I, I was probably one of the first food trailers or trucks in 7th Street district area, usually they're in the south side or the north side. Um, so I got a lot of pushback and from other restaurants that were around the neighborhood and um, just didn't want me there and it was, I was like, I'm, I'm a nice person, I'm not <laughs> trying to, like there's enough business for everybody and um, I wasn't going, I, it was, I was feeding the bar crowd and, like, right. and then just, we didn't have that late night food and we have Whataburger or Old South and then there was nothing else. So I wanted to be that, fulfill that void there. So how did that transpire into, and now I want to open a restaurant? Like what, what was happening going, going at that time? Well, throughout the entire opening of Taco Heads, I knew I didn't want to stay in a trailer forever. Right. So when we were going through our branding, the guy that was doing my, my branding at the time, I always put wheels on it. And I was like, mm -hmm. no, 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 I'm not going to be in a trailer forever. Like I just knew it. Right. So. Um, we made sure there was nothing that said truck or trailer or wheels on the on the branding or anything. So I knew I wanted to eventually step out and open a restaurant. And the first one was the one on Montgomery, right? Yes, yeah. Which is funny because I originally signed the lease for the space on where Dini's is now. Yeah. That was originally going to be Taco Heads. And then the timing wasn't right. Because they hadn't done the re revitalization of the they, street yet, South Main. Yeah. yeah, so the street just took a lot longer than it really was supposed to. And it, I think we were just way too early. We were way too early. Um, and then found this space on Montgomery Street and was like, oh, this is cute. And called the, we had to track down the landlord. Mm -hmm. And he finally got a hold of me back. And um, yeah, then he was like, this space is yours if you want it. And I was like, and awesome. How long was it open before Dickie's Arena was Oh completed. gosh! Um, Had they even turned ground on Dickies at no, that point? Yeah. we didn't even know it was happening. Wow! So I signed the lease in 2016, right? And so we opened September 2016, or sorry, um, January 2016, and then Dickies I think announced around 2019, 2018. Something like that, Something I forget, like yeah. 2018, maybe? Yeah, you, you lucked out in, in a lot of different ways. Because yeah. I remember coming to see you before the rodeo, and you're like, I'm slammed. And you're slammed <laughs> yeah. for that whole period. And yeah. we weren't, the restaurant wasn't set up to hold a 14,000-seat arena across the street. Sure. So we recently just closed down and did a remodel and had our first big concert. Michael Boulay was last night. Oh, yeah, yeah, And, yeah, um, yeah our build-out worked out, and so we were successful, and everyone had a great time, and that's what we want. Well, so through, so through setting up all these businesses, I'm sure you've learned a lot, like just the oh, process. Yeah. And tell us some of the things like you've learned through the process. Um, well, permitting, architect build out, mm -hmm. um, what VE means, which is uh, value engineering. Right, so right. You come up with these all these great ideas and it doesn't fit your budget, so you got to VE that. So <laughs> I know that term very well. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'll, they're the mainly construction and build out and city ordinances and fire suppression system like things you never I'm thought a, would enter your, in your I'm, life yeah, yeah i'm really good with the fire suppression system there you go so, okay yeah. well talents all the way around yeah <laughs> tell us what a typical day is like for sarah castillo oh um wake up early and i, I i'm an early bird which is really random because i used to the trailer i would wouldn't go to bed till like 4 a.m mm. 
now I get up relatively early um, and I just start my round. So usually it's Taco Heads in the morning since we're open early. And then I make my rounds to manager meetings and thinies and then side saddle and just kind of the night in my day. But yeah, <laughs> How just do you constantly. Oh, probably with a glass of tequila. That's where I was going to go next. <laughs> yeah. You love tequila. I love tequila. And you spent a yeah. lot of time going to Mexico, agave, all the, the pieces of it. Did all the tours, yeah. And I think for myself and maybe a lot of people, maybe not understand that tequila has, I mean, flavors. Just like yes. every, yeah. So tell us a little bit about what makes a tequila good, What? Yeah. how do they flavor it, that sort of thing. Well, I just, I love what tequila is becoming and what has become um, and what most people think tequila is or has been in the past, so, and I don't fault them for it, but I had that same thing. It's like, I had a Jose Cuervo Gold in college, and mm. it wasn't the best memories I've had of tequila. <laughs> um, if you could remember. Yeah, if you that, could yeah, remember. remember yes. <laughs> so then later on, like, time goes by, then you really, you kind of forget those memories, and then you start trying tequila out again, and realizing, like, 100% agave tequila is extremely different from what we experienced back when we were younger, or the Jose Cuervo Gold. Sure, or Pepe um, Lopez or something. Yes, That's really yeah. bad, yeah. So now it's becoming more of a hobby. So you have your Tequila Ocho, your Fortaleza, and you, you start branching out and really tasting the spirit. Um, it, and it's extremely beautiful, and it's a, I love our heritage, and I, mm -hmm. just like Mexican food, like I go to Mexico City, Guadalajara, um, Chao de Jalisco, and went to tequila and we've done all the tours i've seen herodura uh patron um jose Cuervo's grandson who had did a, a um maestro dobel which is like a, his craft tequila okay so really like exploring tequila in the way it's made and really have that appreciation for it well i remember i was in your restaurant at some point and you just got back from mexico and I think you you batched your own tequila, didn't you? At yeah. one point, yeah. And yeah. You, you let me try it. So, so we've had a couple barrels that we we partnered with. So we partnered with Herdura and Patron um, and Maestro de Bell. So we've and it's been such a great experience. And they are, I mean, they just bring you in. They show you the how to dig the pina up and cook it, and versus stove oven um, versus autoclave, um, just the way you press the juices out, like all of it. Every single technique, it makes that tequila special. So. Do you know how many varieties of tequila you have oh, at, at any places? Oh, my gosh. Um, actually, Forward Texas reached out the other day asking how many mezcals we had. So we have over 30 mm -hmm. of mezcals. Wow. Um, probably about 20 so tequilas. But, yeah. And, and Glenn, my business partner, he, like I like tasting with him because he, he has a really great nose and palate. Um, but it's a lot of fun to like really dig in to see like where it comes from, which family farm it comes from, and whatnot. But well, I'm really disappointed you didn't bring some tequila I know, today. Yeah, it was on my list of things to do today. <laughs> so we could take a shot here <laughs> yeah. on the show. I was going to do that, but you know, I'm a firm believer that uh, you know we all you know we didn't get here alone. Wherever we are, mm -hmm. someone helped us along the way. Do you oh, have absolutely. a mentor, someone that, that helped you and sort of opened those doors for you? Oh, I mean, or I don't, more I have, yeah. yeah, several. Yeah. I mean, just to, the first one was Jimmy from Seventh Haven. Mm -hmm. So he let me park in his property um, last minute, built me a, a patio and we, he got me a beer one night after a really great successful night and he was like, hey, do you want to make this permanent? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, okay, let's do this. And so he was always, he used to call me the daughter, the sister he wished he never had. Because um, <laughs> I would always call him like, Jimmy, this is broken. Can you help me fix it? And I wouldn't just let him fix it. I would ask him like, okay, what are you doing? So, I mean, I can wire a 220 plug now. I don't want to, right. <laughs> but I can do it. Um, but little things like that. And then, I mean, Glenn from Pogue Mahone's been, he's a business partner now, and but always was a big brother mentor looking up to. Gloria Starling um, from Capitol Grill. Gosh, I mean, like, John Bunnell. Everyone that has, that's what's great about Fort Worth. Yeah. Like, everyone has, wants to be helpful and wants everyone to succeed. And we're not competitive in, in the food industry. Like, we want everyone to be successful because Last thing we want is a failure, failed restaurant in our city. Um, right. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't help us. Like, so we want everyone to be successful. So everyone is, I mean, they've seen me grind in a food trailer, driving the trailer with the water tank hanging over. 
and they would honk and it's like, Sarah, your water tank. <laughs> I'm like, hi. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so everyone's been wonderful and great. I mean, just little things. The, the pastor, the minister from Christ Chapel, I catered a party one night, mm -hmm. one time, and I couldn't back in my trailer. This was early trailer days, so now I can back in a trailer <laughs> anywhere. So, but he got out, and I was like, oh my gosh, like you're Christ Chapel pastor, and he like backed in the trailer. So That's, just little things like that. I'm I've glad you brought that up because that was that was one of my questions. Like, why is Fort Worth? Could you could you have done this somewhere else, or was Fort Worth part of that whole mix of of that? people want to see you succeed yeah no I mean not to bring up bad memories but I tried we tried to do it in Dallas and it didn't work out mm -hmm. um, we closed right at COVID and mm -hmm. it was just a bad location construction and we got broken into eight times so yeah. it, it no no harm or, or no like bad foul or no feelings towards yeah. Dallas mm -hmm. but it just wasn't for me so right um, I know where I belong and it's Fort Worth and that's my that's my community. That's great. Yeah. Well, thanks for being here today. How can people find you? Website? What do, What do you? How yeah. Can... Um, Instagram, Facebook, right. but tacoheads.com, Thenies, fw.com, and sidesaddlesaloon.com. Okay. Great. Yeah. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me. Y'all try out her restaurants. They're beautiful. They're amazing food, and just great atmosphere all the way around. So uh, check them out. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Fort Worth Forward. If you have guest ideas for us, send them our way to the district3 at fortworthtexas.gov email address. I hope you've learned a little bit more about what makes Fort Worth great and how we can keep moving Fort Worth forward. Thank you.